one room school, which we don't have anymore. And uh, we had one teacher, she taught all of us. We'd have the old pot stove for our uh, heat. And that was done by coal. Now that stove had to be taken care of by the bigger boys. And they would get there early in the morning and start that stove up and have it going so it would heat the building up for when we had school. And then when it was cold days, we gathered around the stove to keep warm, but we still got our education. Woke up this morning with my mind and it was stayed on freedom. Woke up this morning with my mind and it was stayed, stayed on freedom. Hallelujah. 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 For African Americans in Delaware in the 1920s and 30s, their early education left an indelible mark. Faced with the prospect of attending poor schools, their lives were transformed in new buildings constructed by Pierre S. DuPont. The memory of these schools and the education they received remains fresh in the minds of this generation. Yes, that brings back memories. We had all outdoor toilets. We had a pump in one corner. We did not have running water at all. We had playground equipment, which usually wound up in swinging around the pole, and that's about all you got out of that. The educational environment for African Americans changed completely in the 1920s. Pierre S. DuPont believed that the state's educational system was seriously flawed. He used six million dollars of his own money to build schools throughout Delaware, including 89 schools for African Americans. Hundreds of African American school children wrote to P.S. DuPont. Buttonwood Avenue, Newcastle, Delaware, October 30th, 1925. Mr. Pierre S. DuPont, Wilmington, Delaware. Dear Sir, we're celebrating DuPont Day. You have helped the colored people get fine schools, but we have not gotten any yet. We are hoping to get one by Christmas. The school we have now is in the Methodist Church in Buttonwood. It is not well built and in the winter it is cold in there. I sincerely hope we shall get a new school soon. Yours truly, Sylvester Wolford. Mr. Wolford, is this the house that you were raised in? Yes, it is. And I have to ask you about this tree. The tree was here, but it's grown and grown and grown, but it was here when I first got here. I was three years old. What was it like going to school that was in a church? Oh, it was just the same, only it was complicated, moving the desk around and having a hot, hot belly stove had to be moved every weekend. The chairs and desks had to be moved every weekend and replaced so that we could replace it for the people to sit uh, on Sunday. It was very complicated and then it was very cold sometimes. And you couldn't get the heat going. But we had quite an experience being in a one-room building at a church. It was one-room school with eight grades. The teacher had to teach all eight grades. They had to be some pretty talented teachers. Oh, yeah, they got a big job and what I call a pat on the back. <laughs> DuPont built the new African-American schools to the highest standards. Attendance increased dramatically, and attendance parades were held. Highly skilled teachers working in pleasant environments brought new excitement into the classroom, 
where children were not only taught academic skills, but life skills and African-American history and culture. It was a brick school. Oh yeah, nice, nice brick school. And according to our estimation of it, it was a very large school. It had, uh, it was only one room, but uh, it was much larger than what we came from. It had windows on one side all along and nice uh, light came in. We had a place in the back where students could do some work. And then we had a place out from the school. We had our furnace out there. So uh, we were really equipped like we had never been equipped before. I mean, little country school that we were in, and then going to something like that yeah. was really something. The African-American community thanked P.S. DuPont through letters, poems, songs, and commemorative events. Leading African-Americans formed the DuPont Testimonial Committee, and on the advice of W.E.B. Du Bois, commissioned noted Harlem Renaissance artist Edwin Harleston to paint P.S. DuPont's portrait. The DuPonts not only built these schools, but it was through their influence that the state eventually, even though it was segregated, that the state eventually uh, did what it was supposed to do for the citizens of all, of all, all the state. Uh, and we, we, we must never forget the contribution that the DuPonts made in, in that area. Do you remember the DuPont song that Mr. Colburn wrote? Yes, I remember very well. Yes, well, yeah. I remember that um, he wrote the song and always had your group singing it. DuPont, DuPont, DuPont is the man. DuPont, DuPont, the best man in the land. He gave us schools and he gave us roads. He lifted our hearts with a great big blow. After Pierre DuPont finished building the schools, talented and dedicated African-American teachers turned them into first-rate educational institutions. Gladys Clark entered a DuPont school in 1925. This school was great. Mr. Anthank, when we were learning long division, he would put a long division on the blackboard a quarter to 12. Our lunch hour didn't begin until 12 o'clock. But if you got that division correct, you could even go home for lunch, because we all walked home in those days. If you didn't get it, he kept you there until you learned it, which meant he denied himself his lunch time. He was so concerned that we got what we were supposed to get. The teachers made great sacrifices for us. Segregation, however, hampered the teachers' efforts. What kinds of supplies did you have? Uh, did you have paper and pencils? To, uh, well, yes, we had supplies. But as far as the books, we never got new books. What would happen after the books had been used for maybe three or four years or maybe longer at the other schools, which we call the white schools, mm -hmm. uh, we would have to send, they didn't even deliver the books most of the time. The larger boys in the school would have to go over to the white schools and bring the books to Booker T. Washington. And many times, uh, some of those books were not in too good a condition. So along with the books would come rolls of scotch tape. And before we could start studying from the books, each student would have to go through the book and repair the pages that had been torn by the other students that had used them for so many years. And in the front of the book, you'd see lists of names of students that had used these books before you got them. Which means that our information was always far behind what they were getting at the other schools. For instance, when, when we were, when they were reading about Lindbergh, we were still reading about the Wright brothers. That's how far behind we were. So it was a challenge, but 
I guess at that time, we didn't really realize how bad it was. Mm -hmm. But our teachers were very interested in our keeping the books nicely, even though they were old books. We had to make covers for them. We took brown paper bags and opened them up and scotch tape and made covers for the books, put our names on the outside and put the title on the outside. And we cared for those books as if they were brand new books. Everything we got in that school was secondhand. It was what the white schools threw away. From the books, to the baseball bats, to the baseballs, everything we had. That was discrimination, that's the way it was. Now, I thought I remember you telling me you even got used pencils. Yes, we did. They were already sharpened. Some of them would be very small. Very seldom were they long pencils that had not been sharpened. They'd come tied up in a string and be brought into the classrooms and circulated around. I mean, that was the most amazing thing I'd ever heard, used pencils. That was well, just... Well, everything was used that we had. One of the most significant institutions in Delaware for African Americans was Howard High School. Built shortly after the Civil War, the original Howard High School became a center for African American education. Edwina B. Cruz, the first African American school principal in the state, ran Howard from 1875 until 1920. Under Cruz's leadership, Howard's education was based on the classical model, with all students taking Latin. This was balanced with extensive cultural activities, including literary societies, debating and dramatic clubs, along with athletic teams. She recruited some of the nation's foremost African-American educators. Alice Dunbar Nelson chaired the English department for more than 15 years. Dunbar Nelson was also the wife of noted poet Paul Lawrence Dunbar. In 1928, when Pierre Dupont completed the state-of-the-art Howard High building, enrollment increased dramatically and the curriculum grew to include both academic and vocational subjects. Howard High School became a pillar of the black community. Marian Anderson, W.E.B. Du Bois, and other leading black figures spoke in the school's auditorium. It was the only free African-American high school in Delaware until the 1950s. This is Sam Peterson. I'm a country boy. I lived in Hookheston, Delaware. 1925, I decided I was going to go to Howard High School. We lived outside of the little burg of Hookheston, so we lived around about two miles from the train station. We had to walk those two miles and be there by 7.30 because the milk train came through and that's when they picked us up. We got on that and rode into Wilmington at uh, 16th and DuPont Street. We walked from there, out Delaware Avenue, past Wilmington High School, on into uh, Howard High School at 12th and Iron Street. And there's where we started our high school education. I'm just looking at how well this is made. Tell me about this. Mr. Whitten was one of my favorite teachers. Now, in his shop, he had me make a desk. And then after I did that, I made a chair to fit the desk. I remember how he made me make a mechanical drawing of this. He's had a lot of influence on me all my whole life. 